right, everyone, we can then go ahead and get started. So first of all, thank you all for joining us. We're really excited to share with you a bit more about the um, EdTech offering and how it uh, its technology is really expanded in use. And we're really excited to share with you how you guys might be able to benefit from that as well. Uh, so first off, my name's Ashley. I am part of the Ponton team as an account manager based out of Sacramento. So I handle a good chunk of Northern California and Northwest Nevada. Um, Michael Emanuel is our presenter today. He has been with ATI's NTech group for quite some time. And uh, one of the products that he's going to share with you is really his brainchild. So he's probably the best person to possibly explain this technology to us. So we're really excited um, to have him doing this webinar for us. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, a lot of us are still working from home, so uh, apologies in advance for any uh, kids or dogs or anything like that in the background, bear with us. Um, and then on the left-hand side of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Uh, if you click that, at any point you can deliver a question to us. We will be constantly monitoring that. Michael also does have some break points in his presentation where we can stop and address questions that have come up to that point. Uh, we do want this to be interactive, so please do um, ask any questions or ask for any clarification if it does come up. Uh, we would love to answer those for you. Also, you should see a hand raise option um, on your left-hand panel bar. And with that option, you can also request to be unmuted if it's easier to ask your question verbally rather than um, in written form. So that's always an option for you. Um, other than, oh, one more thing, this will uh, be recorded. So we will go ahead and send out a recording of this either later today or tomorrow so that you have an opportunity to go back and review anything you want to review. Or if you want to share this with any of your colleagues that maybe couldn't make it to the um, presentation, you can feel free to do that as well. Uh, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Michael and we can get started. Thanks, Ashley. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Emanuel. I'm sitting in Denton, Texas, which is just north of Dallas. Um, a little about me. I grew up in Florida on a bayou, believe it or not. I was, uh, if you ever saw the old show Flipper, like with the kid and the, the dolphin, he's always out in the boat. That was me, except I didn't have a pet dolphin. Um, but I was lucky to, to grow up on the Gulf Coast back before air conditioning. So it was fairly primitive and I could explore all day long. And of course, the changes since then have been incredible. And I had the opportunity to go to school later in life and chose to go into the water field. And I have not regretted it. It's been a, it's been a real joy, actually. And, and I reminded all the time about the people who work in this field. And I just want to give a shout out to all the public servants, all of you folks out there that work in this field. You really do us a great service. So um, what we're going to talk about today are underwater ultrasonic sensors. Okay, These are sensors that have to be in the water to work. They're tuned to the frequency of sound through water. So just like an in-air ultrasonic where you're looking for a level, like a water level or some kind of powdered solid or what have you in a silo. Uh, this makes it has to be under the water, and what you're looking for is a surface down in the water column, typically a, let's say, a wastewater clarifier, a clarifier, some kind of endless. Um And we, the exciting product that Ashley referred to is what we call our filter smart product, which is using the same technology, but we add a uh, little inexpensive or to the sensor. You get two measurements at once. Um, and we put that in the top of a gravity filter, and it's really transforming the way water managers are managing their their, uh, their uh, filters. So the way this this presentation is going to go, I'm a little about interfaces, both on the sludge and the media side, the filter media side, um, and then how they work, and then some examples and benefits of uh, of the, both the sludge blanket monitors and the filter backwash monitors. And then I'll end up with talking about the configurations, like how you actually install them and the different kinds of configurations that we uh, are able to provide. Okay, so I, as Ashley said, I'll have a couple of uh, uh, breaks or about a half a dozen breaks as we go through this presentation and I'll pause and ask for questions. So the first thing is let's talk about interface, uh, what an interface is. 
Webster's Dictionary defines an interface as a surface between two bodies, spaces, or phases. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen an uh, oil-water interface, um, those types of things. If you're in the wastewater field, you're looking in a sludge judge, you've seen you know, water and sludge interface. But for those who aren't so familiar with them, I want to do a little bit of a, of, a, of a quiz here. I used to have a professor that said, he was a retired military, and he said, if, 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 I, first of all, you never give a student an even break. And the second thing he always said was, it's never too early for a quiz. So here we go. Normally, I would ask for a show of hands, but how many interfaces do you see in this picture? Okay. And I'll just cut to the chase. There's about 9, 10, 11, if you count the, the uh, condensation on the surface of the glass. The, the condensation glass interface would be an interface. The, the air condensation interface would be something as well. So just, just get in your mind that interfaces are surfaces. And of course, all we're looking for is a surface to bounce a sound signal off of, okay? The product name is Echo Smart. Echo refers to the fact that we're, we're gonna be listening for an echo off of that surface. And Smart refers to the fact that the analyzer is down in the sensor. So some common interface. Hey, sorry to interrupt. I just wanna let you know you're breaking up a little bit and then your presentation is not full screen. Well, let's see here. How about now? Um, we see slides, but still a still picture. Okay. Well, it, 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 well, let me, let me just summarize what I, I explained um, without the video. And this video is available online, and for anybody who wants a link to it, I can certainly provide it. But, but as I mentioned, there's a constriction in the bottom of the sludge judge. And if you go down with that sludge judge too fast, um, that constriction causes the water coming into the sludge judge to come in at a slower pace than the sludge judge is actually going down through the water. So when the sludge judge gets to the bottom of the tank, the water inside the tube is much lower than the water level outside the tube. And so of course it's gonna to want to equalize. And so it's gonna suck up more material from the bottom of the tank. Of course, that's where the sludge judge is. And so it can wildly inflate uh, the results. Uh, what this video shows is if you go in very, very slowly, you know, this guy does four different measurements. He goes in very slowly. He gets a couple of inches of sludge. He goes in the next time faster. He gets about a foot of sludge. He goes in another time very fast. He gets a couple and a half, two and a half, three feet of sludge. And then he goes back and does it very slowly again and just gets a few inches of sludge. Uh, so that's just our little public service announcement today for sludge judge technique. Uh, another method for uh, measuring interfaces uh, in water, wastewater, is a portable TSS meter, total suspended solids meter. Typically, there is a, a gap with a, either a light source or some type of conductivity, what have you, and there's a markings on the cable about every foot. And the idea is, is when it gets down to some preset density, um, then the device will give you a little beep or a light will shine or, or what have you, letting you know that you've quote-unquote, your interface. Secchi disk, of course, can be used in the top of a gravity filter to get a gauge of some, some kind of gauge of how much expansion you're getting to your media. It's, it was originally developed to use to, you know, to, to get a, a, a relative measurement of the turbidity of water, um, but I've seen it used in, in filters as, as well. This is one of my favorite pictures out of this entire presentation. I call this cups on a stick. Um, these are literally Dixie cups that have been duct taped to a wooden stick. And the idea is you put this stick down into the, to the top of a gravity filter to the level of a static media, like when the media is not expanded. Then when you do a backwash, that media is going to rise or that bed is going to expand. And you hold that stick at the same elevation and that media will rise up and fill up successive cups until it reaches its limit. Uh, so if you get in this picture, let's say six or eight inches of expansion, you might fill up two or maybe three cups. And so you've got some kind of measure of how high that media got at some point during that backwash. 
of course, that's just a spot check. It's just a one-time uh, measurement. So it's really just kind of a snapshot. This is another version of that. They're called pan pipes or organ pipes, typically. Uh, the principle is the same, though. You put this down to the level of the static media um, level, and then you run your backwash, and the media is going to expand and fill up successive cups until it reaches its maximum, and then you get an idea of how much media you have. This is the same thing except in a spiral version. But here's the point. Those are all as far as filters are concerned, those are the, uh, you know, that's the gold standard for how people have been measuring media expansion. I mean, that's the state of the art. So it's really very primitive considering all the tools that we should have available to us. Okay, so at this point, I'll pause to see if there are any questions. Uh, no, it looks like we don't have any, any questions. Uh, at the moment. Great. Great. Okay, so I'm here really to talk about this line of equipment here. Um, there's two main products. There's the Echo Smart product, which is usually used for measuring sludge, and then the Filter Smart product, which is for use in a gravity filter. They both use the same hardware, the differences in the software. Okay. The I, the device you see on the upper left here with the display, that's what we call our controller. Um, it is not the analyzer. As I mentioned before, the analyzers are down in the sensors. Okay. So you've got our controller, the EchoSmart controller. You've got a power supply. This is more than a power supply. It's really a, a communications hub, but we call it a power supply. Uh, and then you have three different sensors. This is a standard sensor. With Notice it doesn't have the wiper on the face of it. Um, we have a, a self-cleaning or wiper sensor. And then we have the sensor that has, it looks just like this wiper sensor, but it has the built-in turbidimeter, and that's the filter smart sensor. Okay. Now, the reason why you have to have a wiper here, um, and, and, and let's put it this way, this sensor does not have a wiper, and that's used primarily in wastewater plants uh, where you've got a surface skimmer or some type of moving equipment like flights in a, in a, uh, a rectangular clarifier that can push that sensor out of the way. We provide, in that case, we provide what we call our multi-flex assembly, which is a flexible device that allows, that, that that's what the sensor is mounted to. Of course, if the sensor's down in the water and your surface skimmer comes by or your some scum skimmer comes by, you have to have a way to accommodate that. So this flexible assembly, uh, uh, that's what's impacted by the, uh, by the skimmer coming by. And it guards the sensor, and the sensor just rides up over the skimmer arm as it passes and then plops back down in the water. Okay. Well, as it plops back down in the water, that's what keeps bubbles and gas or, or what have you off the face of the sensor. Since these are underwater ultrasonics, they have to be in the water to work. OK, if they're in the air, we won't get a valid return signal and it'll just hold its last value until it's back in the water. OK, likewise, if you get a lot of bubbles or a lot of gas on the face of a sensor, that's going to degrade the signal or could kill the signal. OK, so you always have to have a way to clean the face of the sensor of bubbles and gas. And so in a wastewater plant, it's ideal. This sensor is about the size of a hockey puck. It's very light. It rides right over the skimmer, plops back down the water. The cool thing is, is that's almost virtually maintenance free. Okay. If you're in a drinking water plant, let's say, or even a wastewater thickener, um, those tanks typically don't have a scum skimmer or a, a, a skimmer on top. So you have to have a way to clear those bubbles off the face of the sensor. And that's where that wiper comes in. The wiper is not really designed to move a lot of stuff like grease or heavy, heavy deposits. If you've got heavy deposits, then you've got issues in the process typically. Uh, but these will keep bubbles and slime and that kind of stuff off the face of the sensor. Okay. So how do these work? Here's a, a graphic of a typical clarifier, let's say. And let's just say that this is a sludge blanket in a, in a wastewater clarifier. Notice that the sensor is here just below the, the surface of the water. It typically is hanging from the guardrails, the handrails, um, and pointed towards the bottom of the, of the tank. 
Now let's go back and revisit the, the idea of interfaces. Okay. The interfaces, that's a boundary between two phases. So in this case, when we get to this layer, this light layer, that presents an interface between the supernatant and this layer of light sludge. Okay. Likewise, there's an interface farther down where more settled sludge resides. And then also don't forget there is a sludge concrete interface at the bottom of the tank. Okay. Well, if the sludge is light enough for that sound signal to go all the way through, then you're going to get a big echo off of the bottom of that tank. Okay. And that's what I've drawn in over here on the side. The amplitude of this black spike pointing in the right direction. Okay. In other words, how tall that spike is from left to right gives you an idea of how strong that echo is at that depth of the tank. Okay. So that echo corresponds to the concrete sludge interface. All right. There's another little spike in this graphic right here where my cursor is, and that corresponds to this layer between the light sludge and the darker sludge. And then the signal represented where this, this arrow is pointing, that would be the initial interface that we encounter as we go down through the water column. Okay. So what I've done is I've actually just drawn in what we call an echo profile. It's, an, it's a profile of the echoes that we're hearing as we explore the depth of that water column, okay? So we know exactly when that sensor generates a ping, and we know the time that we receive the echo, okay? We know how fast that sound travels through water, and so the way that we determine where the, the blanket is located is just a time of flight measurement, okay? So we take that signal and we turn it on its side like this. And this is what you would see on the display. Over on the left side, this little marking right here indicates the sensor location. This little hash mark represents the bottom of the tank, okay? And then this area indicates the sludge. This is the spike that we get off the concrete bottom, the big echo that we get off the concrete bottom. And then here is a situation. It's, this isn't reflective of that previous graphic. This is reflective of a sludge profile where you've got very clear supernatant and bang, you've got a really good solid interface. Okay. So in a situation like this, this would be the kind of signal, and we see these all kinds of versions of these signals, but when we see a very vertical aspect to the signal like this, that tells us that you've got a very good, well-settled interface, settling conditions are good, and this would be a great candidate, this tank would be a great candidate to be able to pump uh, sludge, let's say, you know, uh, return activated sludge or wasting, um, you can pump off of that signal and that's done quite often. Okay. Now let's contrast that with a different signal. Notice that this signal shows kind of a ski, ski ramp coming down in this area. Now think about this. As we go down through the water column in the previous slide, we got no return signal until we boom, we get to that nice clean interface. In this case, what we're seeing as we go down, we get a little bit of a return, you get a little bit more of a return, a little bit more echo, and then we get to that settled, uh, a more settled zone of sludge. What this profile is showing us is exactly what was in that previous graphic, where you've got a, lot, a layer of light sludge, and then a foot or so down, you've got another layer of well-settled sludge, and then you have the bottom of the tank. So the, the shape of these echo profiles tells us everything about what's down there. It doesn't tell us the density of the sludge, but it tells us where that density changes. And that's typically where the interface is. Now we can take that output and we can show it to you graphically like this. So this would be the representation of uh, where that well settled interface is. Now, as it, as it happens, since we can see both of those interfaces, the light one as well as the subtle one, we can give you both of these outputs, okay? And there are customers who use this um, 
and I've got slides that kind of illustrate this in you know, data data sets. If you can imagine that both of these values reside in the same place. So let's say that you didn't have any dispersed solids above your main interface. That would be an indication that you're getting very, very good settling. Okay. If you're tracking the dispersed solids interface uh, and they're both together, all's good. Once they start to diverge, let's say you see your dispersed solids start to diverge from your main interface. That's an indication that your settling is being affected by something that could be temperature it could be loading it could be uh, you know there are all kinds of causes so we've had customers that use both of these outputs to do dosing studies and that helps them dial in their their polymer dosing okay questions to this point it looks like we have no questions all right. It's been great. Okay, so I'm going to so I'm going to share some slides um, that kind of give you an idea of what continuous the power of continuous monitoring. Remember, I was talking about um, with the cups on the stick and the and the sludge catch measurement. Those are just snapshots. Those are just discrete measurements. But that blanket or the the media that's moving over time. So really what we offer is continuous monitoring 24 seven. Okay. So let's imagine that you're a, a, a manager for a wastewater plant and you take a job, you know, you've been there, you got everything organized and now you want to start focusing on where your blankets are. And you tell your staff, go out to each one of those tanks for a week and take a measurement every day with the sludge judge and bring me that data in a week. And this is what they bring you. Um, good manager that you are, you have to ask yourself, now, do I connect those points with a straight line or do I do a best fit, like an average kind of best fit? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, good manager that you are, you probably recognize, you know, I just don't have enough data. Go out there and take multiple measurements a day for a week and bring me that data, okay? This is what they bring you. You still have a question, can I, I connect those dots? Is it appropriate to connect those dots with a straight line? Or do I average best fit them somehow or what have you? Well, here's the thing. This is the picture that continuous monitoring brings to you. Excuse me. <coughs> Notice you've got diurnal patterns that occur here. Okay, these, these, these um, Regular ups and downs occur. I mean, most of you probably know this. They, they occur because our water usage and the plant, you know, the receiving of that that water over the course of a day, it follows certain patterns. Um, the cool thing about this is this is a, a a thickener, okay, in a wastewater plant, and the idea is to send this good thickened sludge to an anaerobic digester as a next step in the process. The last thing you want to do is to deplete that tank of sludge, or in other words, turn the pump on and leave it on until there's no sludge in the tank and you're tracking zero blanket down there. And that's almost what happened here. Notice those sludge judge measurements are spot on. You got one or two here that are a little bit off, but they're in the right place, in the right direction anyway. The rest of them are just absolutely spot on. As a matter of fact, the operator evidently noticed what was going on and made some changes these dots are six minutes apart. So uh, it looks as though this operator head, headed off any kind of a, what they call wormholing, where you just, you deplete the sludge out of the tank and you're just pumping water. And that's a problem, of course, because if you're pumping water to an anaerobic digester, that really upsets the balance in the digester and it takes days to recover from all that hydraulic loading. So that's just an example of how you can use continuous monitoring. And of course, every process is different and different tanks have different personalities. Um, this is a slide of the, the, the two outputs that I was referring to earlier. The blue trend is the well-settled sludge and the red trend is the dispersed solids or the, 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 the rag layer or fluff layer above the main interface. The black triangles are sludge judge measurements. And this is over the course of a week. And as you notice, the, the sludge judge measurements are either on the blue line or somewhere between the blue line and in, in the red 
in its own. Okay. And that is a indication of interpretation of what's in the sludge judge. As I mentioned before, you know, you got, uh, I think it, in, you didn't see the video, but if you've got two and a half feet of sludge and that last foot, half a foot or three quarters of a foot is real fuzzy, um, different people may call that value differently. To, you know, the level in that sludge judge may, may be different depending upon how different people interpret it. So these, this, this variability in where these black um, triangles are is an indication of that. This is an interesting set of data. This is out of a thickener in a drinking water plant. And what this thickener does is it takes, it takes uh, blowdown from clarifiers, okay? And so what happens is, in this process, is the pumps come on for about 10 or 15 minutes, they bring sludge into the thickener, and then the pumps turn off, and then that sludge settles for six or eight hours. And then the pumps come back on again for 10 or 15 minutes, it deposits sludge in this thickener, and then the pumps turn off, and then six or eight hours later, the process repeats itself. And this stair step pattern exactly is intuitively what you would expect to see in a, uh, a process like that. So many times what you'll see is the pattern of the trended data, the continuous trended data that the instrument produces gives you a intuitive, a uh, very graphical kind of description of what's going on in that tank. In other words, now that you know how that process works, oh, of course, well, that's what that data should look like, okay? This is an interesting slide. So in 2012, um, the Republican National Convention was supposed to be in Tampa, Florida. This is, this is South Florida. This is Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Um, I don't know if those of you that follow politics, but... It, that convention was postponed for a day or two because of Tropical Storm Isaac. And this is a radar capture of uh, the day that the Isaac came through the area. It so happened that we had a trial unit, a demo system in Plantation, Florida, which is just uh, west of Fort Lauderdale. And we had data from that week that bracketed that storm. And, and this data, it's really a fun slide because is it, it shows you a couple of things. First of all, it's the reliability of the instrument. You've got somebody out there taking a sludge judge. You've got diurnal patterns coming into this time. Isaac passes just to the west of, of Tampa, and the feeder bands are coming all the way over across the state. Okay. Well, at this point, the plant loses power. The generators kick in, and they get power again. The system reboots itself and just keeps it on tracking. Operator goes out and checks with a sludge judge again. He makes some changes. He, he, he pulls down the blanket, verifies that they lose power several more times. The instrument keeps rebooting itself. Finally, it's tracking. Okay, they're at the height of the storm coming through. The guy goes out and he's verifying where the blanket is. I mean, this is just really fantastic data. And it shows that it's kind of nice to have an instrument that's out there that'll reboot itself and just keep on trucking. But the real fun part of this slide is, is the realization that there's a guy going out there on the top of this clarifier with like a 20 foot sludge judge in a hurricane, basically. It's like, who wants to be that guy? Turns out that guy is actually now the superintendent over the plant. So I guess he had some skin in the game. Uh, this is just a summary of some of the benefits of continuous monitoring with sludge blankets. Remember, you know, even in bad weather, of course, you, I didn't specifically say, but you can trend this data into your SCADA system, okay? Uh, the trends provide a lot of feedback on settling conditions. If you've got good settling, then you can use that signal for RAS and WAS pumping. Um, you can maximize the concentration of the sludge, let's say, out of a thickener going into the drying process, or in the data set that we saw, you can prevent solids washouts or wormholing. Of course, you can set alarms and all that. It helps in terms of limiting human exposure to, in a wastewater plant anyway, uh, unsanitary process environment. And uh, of course, like we just saw, reliability. So another opportunity to ask questions.
It sounds like there's no questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must be next either I'm doing a special job or everybody's a tool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to kind of shift to talking more about filters now. Um, you know, that, that the first half of that this presentation is more about the sludge world. But so here we're going to take the same exact sensors, um, but we're adding a little turbidity sensor to the face of the sensor. So you're getting two measurements in one. And we put that sensor in the top of a gravity filter just below the level of the wash, top, wash trough. Okay. And the idea is when the filter gets clogged with all the little fines and everything, that you have to reverse the flow and backwash that filter. And when you do so, the amount of expansion that that bed uh, experiences is very important. If it's too little expansion, then you don't thoroughly clean the filter. Okay. And that can lead to problems like mud ball formations, um, things like that. In other words, the filter health can suffer over time if it's not thoroughly cleaned. Opposite. It would be if you're getting too much expansion, you run the risk of blowing the media into the wash trough and that media gets carried downstream in the process. And that can really screw the pooch in a lot of ways. Um, and so that's not desirable. So, you know, there's there's a there's kind of a Goldilocks spot in there. And that's typically 25 to 30 percent. That's what a lot of the literature and guidance out there. Uh, uh, recommends. Now, I, I should mention the reason why we filter water in the first place is to take out the little critters that uh, that disinfection won't kill, such as cryptosporidium spores and zoocysts, uh, giardia zoocysts. These are phases of those uh, uh, critters' life cycle where they're kind of like a walnut and they're encapsulated and chlorine doesn't get to them. So the thing is, is they, they can climb on to particles of, of silica or, you know, other, other particles in the water, the turbidity that's in the water, um, and they can actually be filtered out. And so that's why we, we filter uh, our water. So this is a picture of the face of the uh, filter smart sensor. Notice you can see those two little fish eyes in that round light gray area. That's the, that's the turbidimeter. And the whole idea is if we're watching the media, and we're telling you when the wash water is clean during that wash, then you get a full picture of what's going on in the filter. Now, here's how the turbidimeter works. You've got a light source, and that's an infrared LED light source. So that should last way longer than the sensor will. And it won't drift, by the way. Um, so it doesn't have to be calibrated in the field. As a matter of fact, where we place that sensor in the top of a gravity filter that is not a compliance point. There are no compliance requirements for that uh, for that measurement. It's strictly just a process uh, measurement. So we didn't design the uh, turbidimeter to be calibrated in the field. We designed it to be set and then it stays. So we measure zero to 50 NTU. Um, but the, the way that it works is if there's stuff in the water, this light will be reflected to a light uh, receptor or a sensor that detects that reflection. If there's nothing in the water, that light will just go right by the receptor. But if there's a lot of stuff in the water, you'll get a lot of reflection. And that's how we, we measure the turbidity, okay? Um, to give you an idea, this, this data was actually uh, taken at Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant out there in, uh, in Northern California. Um, what, it, what they did was they, and the, the, the plant personnel did this, they took a Hawk turbidimeter and put it right next to our sensor in a filter and then ran several backwashes. And we've got a handful of data sets and they all look almost exactly the same. You know, we're in lockstep with a much, much more expensive and much more highly accurate turbidimeter than ours. To give you an idea, our turbidimeter, I think, is a $275, or it's a $325 adder on a regular sludge blanket sensor, okay? So it's, it's not intended to be a, a lab grade turbidimeter, but it is very, very repeatable. And that's really all you care about. And the fact that it only goes to 50 NTU is not a big deal because we're interested in where that, that water is trending clean. We don't care how dirty it gets or how high the turbidity goes. We just want to know when it starts trending clean, okay? 
Uh, to give you an idea, this is a signal. This is the same signal that I was kind of talking about earlier. This is a screenshot out of the software that I can use to remotely access our systems. We can put cellular modem in our units and I can go through the software, get on the internet, dial into a unit all the way across the country and see the signal. So this is a filter smart signal. And notice how high and narrow it is. It's a very tall, narrow bell curve, if you will. And that is exactly the same as the echo that we would see, um, let's say the concrete bottom of a tank, if you had clean water in that tank. It, uh, that's, that's how sharp and clear and strong the echo is that we get off of the media in a gravity filter, okay? So I just want to show you that. So how, how does a backwash work? Well, when you're filtering the water, the water level is well above the wash troughs. The water is going down through the media. It's filtering out all the little particles and critters and all that stuff. And then that filtered water goes into... Uh, excuse me, goes into a collection system and it goes past a, a compliance turbidimeter. That's called the effluent turbidity of that water. And of course, that's highly regulated. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, our sensor up here is measuring turbidity, but that's not a compliance point. So it's the one that's under the filter, that filtered water that's being uh, reported compliance wise. Now, when a, a, a backwash gets ready to happen, Typically what they'll do is they'll draw the water level down to about the level of the media. And then there may be an air scour step or a surface wash step. Uh, it's rare to encounter any more filters that don't have one of those um, elements to help break up the media. But what air scour is, let's just talk about air scour. What they'll do is they'll start reversing the flow of water with air in the water. <coughs> and it's a very low flow rate and possibly a good bit of air. And that air and water combination really breaks up this media, okay? And that runs for a little bit and the water level rises a bit, then the air gets turned off. Now, certainly when that water level is drawn down to begin with, our sensor's hanging in the air, okay? So it's holding its last value, as I mentioned earlier. When the sensor's out of the air, it just holds its last valid value. The turbidimeter is measuring the turbidity of air, which is typically zero, okay? Now, when they turn off the air in that, in that air scour, then they increase the, uh, the flow rate a little bit. The water will start to rise. At some point, it'll reach the sensor, and they've closed off an open valve so that the water flows into the wash troughs. And, of course, that's going to be very dirty water at first, anyway. And that water is taken off and either recycled or dealt with um, in the next steps in the process. So again, here's the idea. We're telling you how much expansion you're getting to that media. And then we're telling you when this wash water is clean. Okay. And that's very simple, but it's really very, very important. So this is a typical uh, set of trends. The red trend is your turbidity and the blue trend is the media level. Okay. This point down here on the lower left, where you've got these horizontal lines, that's the point where the water contacts the face of the sensor, okay, as I was just describing. Of course, the turbidity of that water is going to be very high, so our turbidity is going to spike up. It's going to get to 50 NTU. If the water is dirty enough, it'll get to 50 NTU, and it'll peg there at 50 NTU until that wash water starts, coming, starts getting clean. And then that turbidity is going to trend down and to some level, you know, usually it's down around zero to you. Okay. Um, at the same time that the sensor wakes up, you're going to see the media level take off. All right. Now, so here's the thing. Because this instrument has not been around very long, you know, it's control over low rate and time. So, these cycles, these backwash cycles, were based on time and flow rate. So in the manual for those filters, there would be recommendations to use such and such a flow rate, and the engineer who designed that filter or that plant knew that you would get a certain amount of expansion out of that flow rate, okay? And if you washed based on the time that he recommended, he knew with a factor of safety that that filter was gonna be clean, okay? 
Well, now that we have the ability to measure directly what's of interest, and here's the thing, the amount of expansion and the turbidity, that's really what's of interest, okay, when you're, when you're dealing with this process. Flow rate and time are really surrogate measurements for what's really of interest, which is, you know, turbidity and media expansion. So across the country and, and, and in other countries where there are gravity filters, you have this situation quite often. This filter is clean at this point, yet the, fl the high flow rate continues for many minutes. That's clean water that's already been cleaned once. Now it's got to be cleaned a second time, and that's wasted money. Okay, so why not, if you, if we're able to measure what's of interest here, now we're onto something. And that's what's really exciting about the filter smart product. I mean, this, this six minutes or almost 50,000 gallons of water, that's got a value to it. And if you got, you know, if this plant has 10 filters and they're washing every other day, at the end of a year, that is a lot of clean water that's been wasted. And that water can be used or sold and you can realize the savings that's in this zone right here, okay? So I talked about percent bed expansion, 25 to 30%. What that is, is the difference between the static media level and the maximum expansion rate that happens. So it's that distance divided by the total depth of the expandable media. So I've got a calculation here. Percent expansion is that net expansion from the static media level up divided by the media depth, all times 100. So in that case, in our in our example, the media depth was 37 inches, the expansion was nine inches. So that was about 24% expansion, which is, which is decent. Now, there's not a heck of a lot of guidance out there in terms of how much expansion is, uh, is best. The EPA technical guidance manual says 20 to 25%, but it can be as high as 50%. Well, that doesn't really narrow it down, okay? And of course, the reason for that vagueness is because it's, first of all, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to uh, using those tools that I showed you, the, 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 the pan pipes and the cups on a stick, it's really hard to measure exactly how much expansion is going on during a backwash. So there's not been any good data on this type of thing, okay? Likewise, how much turbidity do you leave at the end of the, of the backwash? There's a lot of folks out there that backwash their filters so long, th there's no turbidity left in the filter. But research has shown that if you leave 10 to 15 NTU in the filter at the end of the wash, then it helps to ripen the filter and it makes it more efficient for its following run, for the following filter run. So, you know, here's the thing about this instrument. Yeah, you can, you, can, you can start to see that you can use it to do all kinds of things. As I said, you're, you're, you don't have to rely on the surrogate measurements of flow and time. Now you can actually measure what's of interest. That's the, the turbidity and the media expansion. So any questions now? It sounds like you're doing a great job. Everybody understands well. Or they're taking their <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, you, everybody can always uh, email their questions to, to us at info at ponta90.com um, if, if something else comes up. Uh, but yes, if, if you feel like anything needs clarification, please please use the Q&A. OK, it looks like we got something. Oh, all right. So how much? What is the cost of one of these units? Are, are we there yet? Yeah, I mean, I can I can answer that. It, it's under five thousand dollars for a standalone unit, um, and I, I'm going to address this a little bit more detail. As I mentioned, uh, there's a there's a part of the presentation that deals with in, insulation configurations, and we can create a network of sensors um, using one of those control units with the display. So in that case, if you do a network of sensors, your per tank price goes down. Um, so, you know, if you just do a, 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 a control unit with a display and a single sensor, that's the most expensive configuration and that's still well below $5,000, just to give you an idea. Excellent. Thank you. I uh, have one more. Uh, how often does the NTU sensor need calibration? 
Well, as I, as I mentioned, it's, it's designed not to drift. It, it shouldn't need calibration in the field, I mean, or, or period. If it does need to be recalibrated for some reason, then it needs to come back to the factory. But it's certainly appropriate to take that sensor and to drop it into a solution of known uh, turbidity, you know, like a formazine solution or, um, or that kind of thing, just to check it from time to time. Again, since, yeah, since, since the sensor was, is not at a compliance point, then the decision was made just to try to make that sensor so that it doesn't drift and it won't need to be recalibrated. That's the idea. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to move on here. Um, so back to the, the, this data set. So obviously, if you can save 50,000 gallons of water, a wash and your your cost of producing a thousand gallons of water is let's just say you know a dollar or I'm sorry if it's if it's ten dollars for ten thousand gallons you know then, then you could probably save 50 bucks by reducing this amount of water in this area so in other words you would terminate the wash so that it would intersect so that the blue line here would intersect with your turbidity endpoint that you choose Okay, thereby saving a lot of water. But the real value of this instrument is less about that. That's just the low hanging fruit. The real value of this instrument is what it can show you about what's going on in the process. For example, I can look at this data set now and tell you that that's pumped, um, um, that's pumped water. Uh, the fact that it ramps up and it's held steady and then it ramps back down very symmetrically that indicates that those are, uh, are VFDs that are running those pumps. So the, the shape of some of these curves will tell us a lot. Uh, this is a profile of a elevated wash water source. So in other words, this plant, what they do is they pump their clean water up to an elevated tank. And then when they go to do a backwash, they let that water gravity feed up through the filter. And that's how they wash it. OK, and this notice this has a completely different shape, but there's a lot going on in this data. And that's why I want to choose. That's why I chose this particular set of data to kind of make this point. There's so many things going on in here. So notice this. First of all, the turbidity jumps very quickly. It pegs out at 50 and then it drops very, very vertically here. That's an indication that all of that turbidity is leaving the filter at one time. OK, it also. If you if you knew that this filter that that's this plant they use air scour, so now you know now that makes sense because all the heavy lifting of knocking the fines loose was done by the air scour, and then all the the fines get pushed out of the filter and they all come out of the filter at one time. So that's number one. Number two is look at this curve here, the blue trend. This is the media level. Okay, now the media level is going to be proportional to the flow rate, but what's happening here? you've got a fluttering valve. So as the valve opens to let this backwash water in, it opens too wide, it probably opens a bit and then it closes a little bit and then it opens up more and then it closes a little bit, opens up more. So that, that valve is fluttering, okay? And that's good to know about what's going on in your process. Um, this is where the high rate of flow ends, the high rate flow, backwash flow. Obviously they could save a good bit of water here. Now. Once the backwash is completed, notice what happens. So this is a drinking water plant. So they're washing it to the point where the wash water that we're measuring is practically zero NTU, okay? Then they stop the flow of water and they open up the gates and they bring settled water from the sed basins on top of the filter. And of course their settled water turbidity is a little higher than drinking water turbidity. So we see the turbidity go up. At the same time, as that hydrostatic head builds on top of the filter, as the water level rises, you see that fluffy media right after the wash, it starts to compact. So you can actually see things in this data that give you a lot of insight into what's going on in your process. So this is an interesting set of slides. This was uh, data that came from Everett, Washington. And I apologize, it's a little bit blurry but I can tell you the gist of it is this. 
they were getting about 17% expansion, which is low. Remember, we're trying to get 20, 25, 30, well, 25 to 30% expansion. They're getting 17. And it took this long to get to 5 NTU, okay? So the wash proceeds, and they picked 5 NTU, like, that's how long it took to get there. When they increased their expansion rate to 30%, okay, the green line, 30%, they got to 5 NTU 35% sooner than they did at 17%. And what that seems to indicate that is, is that the more expansion you get, the sooner your turbidity is going to drop. That makes sense, right? So what's really cool about that is the more expansion you get, the higher this blue line gets to a degree, then the more turbidity curve all right that's why this is such a great tool because now you've got an instrument where you can watch your parameters change based upon a change in your process and that's a tool that you can use for optimization so like this slide we're getting very low expansion we're getting uh, about five inches of expansion over 35 that's that's not a lot of great expansion but the very next wash that they did they increase their expansion rate. Now look what happened. That turbidity drops very quickly and very decisively. And, and, and it happened right after they went into their high rate. So they could save all of this water. <coughs> Excuse me. And this happens to be a tertiary filter in a wastewater plant in Vegas. Okay. So even though they're using quite a bit more flow rate, they can actually save water because they can terminate this wash a lot sooner. And not only that, but the real important thing is, is you've got a lot of confidence that you're, you're, you're decisively cleaning that filter. In other words, you're thoroughly cleaning the filter. Whereas in the previous case, I guarantee you, if they were to wash this filter five minutes after this wash and do it at a higher flow rate, they would get more turbidity out of the filter. And what that means is, is that they're leaving turbidity in the filter at every wash, which means that over time, the health of that filter is going to suffer. They're going to start forming um, mud balls and that type of thing. So this is what the instrument's revealing. It's, it's pretty neat. So this is a, uh, another set of data. This is from Oklahoma. And this shows, this is, again, at a glance, I've seen so many of these, I can tell this is actually a, an elevated water source. And in this case, First of all, the turbidity meter, uh, the turbidity doesn't even reach 50 NTU. So in this case, I would ask the facility, how long is your filter run? Uh, maybe they had very low loading um, uh, conditions. You know, there's, there's not much turbidity in their incoming water, so they didn't load that filter very much, in which case they could have extended their filter run if time allowed um, and, and gotten even more efficiency out of the filter. But, but beside that, there's another thing that's going on here. Notice that the water level or the, the media level is dropping across that high rate of flow. What's happening here is as the water level in the elevated tank drops, then their flow rate is de decreasing. Now, on elevated tanks, there's typically what's called a rate of flow controller. So when the flow starts, uh, the, the valve opens up, but it doesn't open up all the way. And you start getting the flow rate, you know, it opens to get you the flow rate that you desire. And then as the water level in the tank drops, that valve should open a little bit more and a little bit more to keep that, that flow rate even. So that, in other words, this, this media level should be horizontal up here, not declining. I don't know if that's very clear, but basically the water level in the tank's dropping. So the flow rate is dropping. And so the media level is dropping. And that would be something that the instrument could point to as a maintenance issue. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting set of uh, data. This was done up in Pittsburgh. And this plant, their driver, they weren't trying to conserve water because they don't have any water. They got plenty of water. This plant's like on the, on the, um, on the junction of two different rivers. Um, what they the problem that these, these guys had was they had already identified the need for a second water treatment plant to increase their capacity because there was so much demand. So they were desperate to lay their hands on every drop of water that they could to satisfy demand. 
And when we did a trial there, we were able to identify at least 11 minutes of flow rate that they could save off their wash. And I think they've got something like 14 filters and they were washing at an incredible frequency like every day. Um, and so when we did the math, we helped them to put their hands on about a billion gallons of water that they could deliver to customers just by making one simple change to their backwash process. And it, it's just, it's, it's incredible. Uh, this is down in San Diego. I don't know if any of those folks are on this on this webinar, but uh, this was a fun. This was a, this was one of the first times. And this was what eight years ago uh, when we first started bringing this instrument to market. We recognized that they could save six to seven minutes of flow rate. This is a tertiary filter in a wastewater plant. Okay, so that represents a lot of flow and a lot of water. And the thing about a wastewater plant is the cost. Of a unit of water produ produced is a lot higher in a wastewater plant than because there's more there's more steps to that process. Um, so the supervisor down there, uh, based upon that data and what they figured the cost of a unit of water was, he did the calculation. They were looking at I believe an eight point uh, network of sensors, and he does the math and the analysis. And he gets to the bottom line, which is it's going to take less than nine months to pay back this instrument. OK, about twenty, about twenty five thousand dollars, thirty two thousand dollars. Let's see. What was it? It's, I think it was about twenty five thousand dollars worth of, of equipment. Nine months to pay it off. And he was incredulous. And he's like, can you please check my math? So when I this email, I went and grabbed up a couple of my colleagues and we went back to a whiteboard. And we started doing calculations because this was the first time that we realized that this instrument could give such a great return on its investment. And sure enough, these the, the math that he did here was absolutely spot on. And these guys are, are completely happy. Or last day, last I talked to them, they were. As a matter of fact, they they ended up purchasing this for one of their for their other wastewater plant, and they're loving it there as well. Uh, this is a little bit closer to home. This is from the Hill Canyon wastewater treatment plant up in Thousand Oaks, uh, or down in Thousand Oaks, depending on where you're sitting. This is a tertiary filter in a wastewater plant, and they figured they could save about 10 minutes of flow rate, okay, off of their wash. They implemented that, um, and I ended up getting this data from them. So this point here, so we did a trial, and we terminated the trial right around May, I believe it was, the next month, that's their wastewater wash volume. The previous month, it's up here. So they basically cut in half the amount of wash water that they were using. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of pumping time, that type of thing. And they automated their process off of the instrument. Okay, so questions. Any, any questions about the filter smart data? Once again, looks like questions are covered. We don't have anything new. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Well, we're just about to wrap up. Um, here's a little case study that's kind of a fun, a fun study. Um, there's a plant down in Punta Gorda, Florida. It's a 10 million gallon a day facility. They have two four cell green leaf gravity filters. So they have eight tanks altogether. Uh, there are four solid contact units, and those are they're basically sed basins, okay, but they're really an upflow clarifier. They're a long rectangular kind of an upflow clarifier. And I'll show you a graphic of what they look like here shortly. Their high backwash flow rate is 52,000 gallons a minute, and the cost of production for 1,000 gallons of water complete, you know, that, that, that cost of production takes into account everything inside the fence, such as salaries, uh, chemicals, electricity, so on and so forth. Okay, a buck 73 per thousand gallons of water. So we stuck one of these in their tank and this was the first set of backwash data that we've got, that we got. And, and notice how anemic the turbidity trend is. The turbidity only comes up to about 20 NTU, scale for turbidity skews over here on the right, comes up to about 20 NTU. They're getting decent expansion but just not much turbidity was coming out of the filter. So I asked them, um, 
how long their filter runs were. And they said, well, they're about 70, 75 hours, something like that. I said, have you ever thought about extending your filter runs and filtering that water for longer? Because that would reduce the amount of backwash water that you would use. And the data here shows that they could clearly get away with it. I mean, this is this turbidity should be going up and up at 50 and hanging there for a little while before it comes down. And they said, well, you know, we used to have longer filter runs. They're around 150 hours. But we had a turbidity breakthrough, which means that the the compliance turbidimeters under the filters measured higher than what their permanent limits would would allow. And so they had to report to the state um, that they had a breakthrough. And then a series of events happened. The Florida DEP, of course, comes in and does an audit and checks them out and gets all up in their business. And it just made life really difficult for them. So they were like, we will never let that happen again. So let's back off of 150 hours of runtime and let's just cut it in half down to 70, 75 hours. And I mean, I can understand them wanting to do that. I actually used to work for the Florida DEP and I, I wouldn't want them getting up in my business. So that's understandable. So they made a policy decision to cut in half their filter runtime. Okay. What that means is, of course, is that they are automatically doubling the amount of times that they're going to have to wash those filters which means they're going to double the amount of hydraulic loading going to their drying process. They're going to have to double the amount of wash water that they have to recycle, uh, et cetera. So we started pulling on the threads in this plant because of this one set of data and it turned into this case study. It's really kind of fun. So they, you know, so for step, step one was they started extending their run times and they figured they could safely go to about 120 hours without any risk. So that's about a 70% increase in runtime. And that resulted in about a 40% decrease in the wash water they use. And that right there represented about $65,000 in savings annually based upon that $1.73 per thousand gallons of water cost of production. Okay. That's just step one. Then once they started getting healthy backwash profiles, they realized they were able to shorten their backwash by about four minutes, okay? So when you do the math and all of that, it's about 12.1 million gallons a year or about another $20,000 in savings, okay? So that brought them to about, a well, let's put it this way, um, about $86,000 in savings based upon those simple changes, okay? And remember, it was a policy decision that got them into that in the first place. And, and most of them had forgotten about that. It was ancient history because it happened years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's more to this then. Um, because they're sending a lot less water to their drying process, they started realizing benefits there as well. So the first part of it had to do with their... Um, their solids contact units. So this is a, a cut section of uh, a cross section of one of the units. It's a, it's a rectangular tank. Okay. And they have a sludge blanket. Water comes in from the bottom and goes through the sludge blanket and then flows into the weirs where it goes off to be filtered. Okay. But the sludge blanket rises to the point where it starts to cascade over into this channel. This channel runs the length of this rectangular, uh, tank. So the sludge blanket or the sludge flows into this, this channel. And what they wanted to do was to see if we could put a sludge blanket monitor above the channel and keep that sludge, in other words, pump off of our signal and try to keep that level very consistent because they had had chronic problems with turning on those sludge pumps and forgetting they were on and leaving them on and depleting the sludge or they would forget to turn them on and the, the, the channel would fill up with sludge, you know, those kinds of things. So we, we gave them a unit to try and uh, they stuck it in there and it worked fantastically. So they were able to actually keep um, this, this level of sludge to a zone about plus or four, plus or minus four inches. And here's a picture. Here, this is the channel. That's one wall. This is the next. Here's our sludge blanket monitor. Here, there it is dry. And here's a trend of that sludge level. And again, like we saw previously, this trend should 
sludge reflect what's going on in that process. So the sludge level builds a bit and it gets to a limit and then the pumps come on and, and pump the sludge out. The pumps go off, sludge builds a bit over time, pump comes on, sludge level drops, et cetera, okay? So that's exactly what you should be seeing in a trend like that. So even more. So they've, they've uh, reduced their pumping costs, they reduced the hydraulic loading to their drying beds. Now, this is interesting. You may have seen these, uh, in that part of the country, this is how they deal with their sludge. They, these are three walled uh, areas with an underdrain, okay? And then they put a foot or so of sand on top of that underdrain to protect the underdrain. And then they pump their sludge water slurry onto the sand and the water percolates down and goes into the underdrain, gets carried back to the headworks and recycled in the plant. The sludge is then left to dry and then they get in there with a front end loader and scoop out the sludge, put it on a truck and haul it off. Okay. And of course, that's why you need the sand is to help with that percolation process, the filtration process, as well as to protect the underdrain from the front end loader. Okay. Well, this is a, I don't know if you can see it, but there's 12 cells in this large drying area. Okay. And they were using all 12 cells. They had a full time front end loader operator out there. Um, scooping up the sludge and dealing with all of that. And they were constant, constantly sending trucks to the dump with their sludge and incurring those tipping fees, okay? When we started pulling on the threads and unraveling their whole process, they got down to where they were using one of those drying cells, okay? The biggest unexpected revelation came when they realized how much money they were paying for sand of all things. They figured they were paying 200 to $250,000 a year on sand. And when I wrote this, uh, with, when I wrote this, uh, this, this case study, excuse me, um, I talked to the plant manager and he's like, you know, we haven't, we haven't ordered sand in a couple of years where we used to be ordering it more than once a year. So totally unexpected, benefits when you just start kind of looking at what the data can show you. It was just a fun, really fun process to go through. So any questions? We actually do have one. Um, so what is the expected life of this instrument? How often do they need to be replaced? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think part of it has to do with whether it's a wastewater application versus let's say a drinking water application. You know, one might be a lot more aggressive on the sensor than the others. But, um, you know, we've got sensors that have been out there for years and years. Um, so, I mean, it really just depends. It depends upon like if it's a wiper sensor, how often that wiper has to wipe. Um, again, I think the environment has a lot to do with it, but typically I think these sensors last six, eight, 10 years. Um, I was just in last year I was at, uh, uh, oh, the East Bay mud plant just over the Oakland Bridge over in Oakland. There's a big plant right there. And they were one of our first EchoSmart customers. And I believe they've got a 16 sensor wireless network, which I'll explain all that stuff in a minute. But they've got 16 sensors that they bought. I believe it was in 2008 or 2009. And when we were at the plant, and speaking to the guy who actually specified those sensors for that project, uh, he made the statement that they had never purchased a replacement sensor or a spare. They'd never have to replace any of them, and they're all working just fine. They love them. So what is that? That's 11 years, something like that, maybe 12. So they, we've got some that have been out there for quite some time. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, we have one more. Um, does the sensor have to be submerged continuously? I have a backwash tank where the water level fluctuates between uh, three feet to 10 feet, and the sludge will slowly build up approximately three feet in five to six months. Uh, I would only need to monitor the sludge periodically and not till the sludge maybe gets to about two feet. I hope I got those measurements right. No, I, I think I understand understand what's going on. So this is a, 
kind of a sludge storage tank and the water level fluctuates and the sludge builds up over a period of time. That could be a little bit iffy because of the fluctuating water level. We always want to, um, we typically want to try to install these sensors so that they're submerged. Um, you know, we use them in applications like sequential batch reactors or SBRs where the water level uh, fluctuates quite a bit. A lot of times the sensor's out of the water. But in those cases, there's usually an elevation where when the process, when, when the measurement is needed, when the sludge measurement is needed, we know that the sensor is going to be submerged. And it kind of sounds like in this case, there will come a time when the water level will be high enough that the sensor will be submerged. And that's the time when the measurement is needed. And if that's the case, then it would be perfectly fine. Um, there are ways that you can cut power to a sensor if it's dry and then put power to the sensor uh, you know, automatically when it becomes wetted. So, uh, you, you can tie your water level, for example, to a, uh, to a switch that will, that will take care of something like that. So, you know, I would just say whoever answered, asked the question, you know, ask one of the Ponton guys that we can, we can have a conversation about that offline and I can really explore that, that, you know, the dimensions of that tank and the frequency of which you need the measurement. And we, we might be able to do that one for you. I just have to know some more details. Thank you so much, Michael. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Okay. So we're getting, getting close to the end here. So there's three basic installation configurations. Okay. There's a standalone system uh, where we take our controller with the display and we can hardwire any one of our three sensors directly to it. Okay. That's why we call it a standalone system. You put 110 power to it, and then you can either get two, four to 20 outputs. And this is, this is true. All of these drawings are true, whether it's echo smart or filter smart. Okay. So you can get either your, if it's the sludge level, then you can get your main interface and your fluff layer via four to twenties or you can take Modbus into your DCS or your SCADA system, then you can get those signals via Modbus, okay? This is the most expensive configuration. As I mentioned before, it's well less than $5,000. Um, and that's with hardware, mounting hardware and stuff like that. Um, I should mention that we can put a cellular modem inside of this controller. And that allows me to dial in and access the unit and set it up, monitor the signal. I can download data sets, just like the ones I've been showing you. All those data sets I've downloaded via modem. And we routinely will loan customers or potential customers of a standalone system so that they can try, try it out, generate some data, see what's going on in their process, and decide whether or not it's going to add value to the process. I mean, we... We've done this for decades and we, we don't have any plans of stopping it. So if anybody who's listening wants to try one of these things, you know, if there's absolutely no charge, we just say, look, you know, if it, if it looks like it's going to add value to your process, budget for it. And we're, we're content to wait until that budget cycle happens. Um, but I can tell you this, there's, you know, plenty of customers out there where we stick one of these things in there and we see stuff going on in the process and it's like, aha, you know, it, 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 it leads to all kinds of, of, of insights and benefits. So it doesn't cost you anything. We're happy to do it. Um, and the cool thing is we can do that remotely. And that's very uh, advantageous now during the COVID, you know, during the coronavirus, because we literally can just ship you this. Everything comes in a box and you can hang it on your handrail yourself. It's very easy to install. As a matter of fact, the Ponton guys or girls, um, would be happy to come out and help install, but it's the kind of thing that most plants can do by themselves. And then I can remotely um, access the unit, make sure it's set up correctly, get your data for you, help you interpret it, help you see kind of what's going on and what kind of benefits you might get. You know what? And if we discover something cool, great, you know, game on. And if not, hey, no harm, no foul. So that's this is the configuration that we would send you, but we would send it to you with a modem. And then after everything's done, you simply just send it back to us. Uh, you'd need an extension cord and a length of three quarter inch pipe to mount the sensor on. So, I mean, those you usually have around. So uh, if there's any questions about the, the demo part of things, I'll, I'll have a, a moment here where, where 
anybody can ask questions. But that's our, our standalone configuration. But what's really cool about Echo Smart and Filter Smart is we can create networks. So here's the control unit. You may or may not want to wire one sensor to it. This could be just on a panel somewhere or in the control room even. And then we take that power supply and we put one of those out at every sensor location. That's what we hire, uh, wire the sensor into. It can be any of these sensors. Um, then we take a twisted pair, just like you would have for a four to 20 signal. And we daisy chain from the control unit to the first power supply, from the first power su uh, supply to the second and so on. And we can network up to 16 sensors in a network like that. So now your, your price per tank goes down because to give you an idea, this control unit is a little over $2,000. The power supply is about $800. So instead of having $2,000 at every sensor location, now you got $800 at every sensor location. So your, your, your per tank price goes down. Uh, just to give you an idea, the sensors are gonna run, for sledge blanket, they're gonna run about two grand. Um, or for the filter smart sensor with the turbidimeter, it's going to run about $2,300. And then the mounting hardware is not that expensive. So um, obviously we're happy to provide quotes if anybody wants to get a sense of what that would cost. But, but this is, uh, it's pretty cool in that, you know, if you've got multiple sensors, that per tank price actually starts going down. So now the way that you get your signal out of these sensors Let's just say that there's no sensor on the control unit, okay? The reason we create this network is so that the controller knows what's going on with all of these smart sensors. Remember, they're smart sensors. They're down there doing the analysis, and then they're just outputting a finished value. And that output is either via two 4 to 20s or via Modbus, okay? So you can pick up your 4 to 20s at each power supply location. Sorry, I just changed slides on you. You can pick up your 4 to 20s here because the 4 to 20s are generated down in the sensor. Um, they're available here. So if you've had other equipment out on a clarifier, we can utilize those 4 to 20 signals, uh, cables, and, and, and that type of thing. If you, if you don't have that infrastructure on your clarifiers or what have you, we can come out of the control unit with Modbus for all the sensors in the network. Okay. Excuse me, let me get a sip of water. We can also put a converter here that will take the Modbus and convert it to, to analog 4 to 20 for all the sensors in the network. And that's a very inexpensive option. This 4 to 20 output here is only by two, and that's for that sensor. You can't get 4 to 20s directly out of the controller for all the sensors in the network, only for the one sensor that might be wired to the controller. Okay. Clear mud. Now, here's a great option, and that is the wireless network. And this is really only for the sludge blanket application. I wouldn't use this for filter smart. Um, but, but basically what it is, there's a $275 radio that snaps onto the board and the controller. And there's one that snaps onto the board and each power supply. And those guys are talking back to the controller wirelessly. So this makes it very easy to retrofit a plant with minimal, I mean, all you gotta do is get power out on your clarifier and you're good to go. Then you can come back and get your signal out of controller via Modbus with all the sensors, or we can put that, that converter here and convert that to four to twenties. Now, the reason why I said that we wouldn't wanna do wireless with filter smart, the sl you know, sludge, a sludge blanket doesn't move very fast. So response time in a sludge blanket application isn't really a factor, but these radios can introduce a little bit of a delay in terms of transferring data. And so because things happen very quickly in a filter application, you know, that media rises and drops very quickly. There's other things that happen very quickly in the filters and, and every few seconds can count. So we really don't want to introduce delays that way. Um, so we try to limit this wireless feature to the sludge blanket world. But, you know, there's always exceptions. If you've only got four four filters, for example, you know, that, that might be a, a, a candidate for the wireless option. But this is pretty slick, okay? Uh, any further questions? This is about it, folks. Uh, 
I don't see anything on the log, uh, Michael, but we we will be taking uh, questions over email. Thank you so much for giving us um, this presentation. There's there's so much value on this on this uh, technology. It's, it's really exciting. Um, we will be forwarding a copy of this recording to all our attendees, uh, as well as people who registered and, and couldn't make it. Uh, but if you have, uh, again, any questions, feel free to reach out and we'll be more than happy to help out with any quotes or discussing your, your particular application. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you again, Michael, and hope everybody has a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Oh! Ha, 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 ha.